Hello, everybody, and welcome. It's good to see you all. I'm Ben Powell. I'm the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech University. Thank you all for coming up to our second public lecture of the semester. Uh, I will introduce our speaker in just one moment. But first, I want to just briefly mention what's coming up next. We have Matt Pritchett, the famous development economist, who will be here Thursday, October 19th, uh, same time, same place, talking about basically uh, niche development programs versus more broad uh, governance reforms that allow more sustained development. And then, later in November, David Scarbeck will be here, again, same time, I think, oh, no, not same place, over at the ICC, and he will be talking about his uh, book on uh, prison governance around the world and how informal governance structures differ based on the constraints faced by prisoners. Uh, it's really kind of, uh, for those with a more libertarian bent in the audience, uh, the mainstream criminal justice, political science professions have looked at it as like, oh, he's doing economics of organizations of prisons, and I look at it as like, he's doing actually like real hard case anarchism, of like hardest ways to make private governance work with some of the most difficult people. Uh, and he's had two award-winning books uh, in both political science and criminology on this topic. Uh, should be fascinating talks. But tonight, we have a great scholar with us first, Phil Magnus, who is a senior research faculty in the F.A. Hayek Chair in Economics and Economic History at the American Institute for Economic Research. Uh, he's also a research fellow with the Independent Institute. He has his Ph.D. from George Mason University School of Public Policy and his uh, bachelor's degree from the University of St. Thomas in Houston. He's also a native Texan. This is his third time visiting FMI. Uh, because we cater to his dinner preferences, which is almost exclusively eating barbecue steak <laughs> while in Texas, except occasionally late night stints at Whataburger. Uh, prior to joining AIER, Dr. Magnus spent over a decade teaching public policy, economics, and international trade at in institutions including American, uh, American University, George Mason, and Berry College. He's the author of five books including the 1619 Project, a critique, which is actually the other thing he's here for, is for our reading group, undergraduate reading group summit. Uh, this weekend, who's been re reading related books, he will be giving a lecture related to that for them. Uh, and also, what would be a fun talk at the university, but not tonight, called uh, Cracks in the Ivory Tower, the Moral Mess of Higher Education. Uh, that he co-authored with philosopher uh, from Georgetown, Jay Brennan. Uh, Phil is a provocative scholar, uh, but his work has been published in very mainstream scholarly outlets as well. Uh, his scholarly research has been published in the Journal of Political Economy, the Economic Journal, Economic Inquiry, the Journal of Business Ethics, uh, in addition to many other places. Also, it has got wide popular acclaim. He has published himself his own popular writing in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Newsweek, Politico, Reason, National Review, and in the Chronicle of Higher Education on the Moral Mess of Higher Education, which endears him to many of our colleagues. <laughs> Please, he's also been, by the way, his research on inequality has been published in very good journals, and he has been a big critic of uh, Piketty and some of the research on that, and that's what he's going to share with us tonight. So please join me in welcoming back to Texas Tech, Phil Magnus. charts and graphs and uh, fun things like that tonight. Uh, ostensibly the subject of inequality, uh, most people hear that they think uh, this is something first that's associated with progressivism, income redistribution, you know, the political left, that sort of thing. Second, it's also a very, very boring, dry numbers oriented subject. And I'm going to try to make it neither of those things tonight. At first thought into this subject, I'll tell you a little bit of the story. Uh, by complete accident. So I wrote a dissertation 
on an even more boring subject that is the tariff policy of the 19th century United States <laughs> and its transition to the income tax system, the federal income tax system, uh, which meant that I spent uh, many, many years downloading PDFs off of the IRS's website and entering in by hand, line by line, all of these different data points from uh, like 1915 as the federal income tax is first being raised and 1917 when it goes up again and tracking things over time, basically building a novel data set. And I thought, uh, you know, this is interesting for me. It got me through the dissertation. Uh, it was a good project, got a few papers out of it, uh, published in economic history journals and things like that. Uh, but they kind of set it aside for a little while and focused on other aspects of the 19th century American economy. And then in uh, 2014, I think it was, I got an email from an old grad school friend. And she says, uh, you still doing that tax statistic stuff that you were doing back in grad school that you presented papers on? I said, well, kind of. Uh, so I dig around in it. She says, well, there's this book you ought to take a look at. It's called uh, Capital in the 21st Century by Thomas Piketty. Many of you probably remember that it became a bestseller. It was a very weird book to become a bestseller because it's a thousand pages long and it's full of dense statistics and data and economic jargon. Uh, but it fit kind of the zeitgeist of the political moment, at least among elite journalism, and that was income redistribution and the case for higher taxes. Uh, so it had a, a, a moment that it just jumped onto the scene. And I start reading this book, and my friend at the lawyer said, you work in these stats, you find this interesting. And I'm reading stats in this book, and they aren't lining up with things that I remembered entering in by hand from PDFs off the IRS's website. So I started digging a little deeper, and problems emerge, and more problems emerge, and uh, you know, one thing leads to another. Uh, next thing, I'm embarking on a uh, multi-year project to reconstruct the entire income inequality series of Thomas Piketty for the 20th and 21st centuries, uh, which I just finished up last week. <laughs> At least I extended it through 2021 last week. Uh, had it through about 2000 before that, and 1960 before that. Uh, so it's been a very uh, intensive, ongoing project. And I want to present some of the data of that today. Uh, in doing so, we're going to dig into what I call the myth of skyrocketing inequality. But I want to ask you, just a show of hands, who has heard some of the claims that you see up here? That the rich pay a lower tax rate than the poor? That's been all over. You can find that on the White House website right now. Uh, that's what happens when you hire a council of economic advisors from the new school. But uh, nonetheless, it is everywhere, and it's all cited to these studies that I'm going to work on. Second thing, who's heard claims about inequality as if it's taking off, it's shooting through the, uh, through the, the, the roof in the United States, uh, that we are at a point in history that uh, has never been more unequal in American economic history. Uh, Gabriel Zuckman, one of the guys I'm going to go after tonight, tweeted that out a couple months ago, and has been all over the place making that claim, and it's just taken as a given. Uh, you also see it uh, making its way into uh, uh, the economic literature, the scholarly literature. This is stuff that's published in top journals all the time. It's filtered into congressional hearings. It'll probably come up in a couple months on the campaign trails, quite possibly in both parties. It's something that's just been accepted as part of the rhetoric. Who's also heard another claim that the United States is an outlier compared to other countries like Europe, places like France, or beacons of equality, whereas the United States is shooting up through the roof. Heard that before. Uh, other places around the world. And, and the claim is always made that they have tax systems that are more equitable and just. They figured it out, whereas the United States, uh, we do something wrong, we service the rich at the expense of the rest. And these claims are going to fit together that you see here. And then finally, you've uh, probably seen some version of this that Warren Buffett claims he pays less taxes than his secretary. Uh, that one's always trotted out. Uh, it's not, not the greatest piece of, of evidence. It's just a, a weird anecdote that comes from, uh, depending on how he uh, deducts certain asset gains or losses relative to uh, um, his earnings in a given year. Yeah, you could probably play some statistical manipulation to get to that point, but I guarantee you over the course of his life, he has not paid less in taxes than his secretary or uh, most Americans. And in fact, uh, if, you, if we actually look up the, the, the very elite, the top 0.001%, it turns out they pay quite a bit in taxes, and I'll give you some data on that. 
But nonetheless, this is something that's prevalent in economic discussions, in the literature, uh, in political discussions, almost been accepted as like a stylized fact that inequality is bad in America and it's getting worse. <laughs> and I'm here to challenge that. Now, I'm not going to deny that inequality exists. I'm not going to deny that uh, inequality fluctuates and changes over time, or even that uh, uh, in recent years it's higher than it was maybe a few decades prior to this. But it's also lower than it was a few decades prior to that. Uh, it's something that gravitates and uh, moves up and down over time, but within a fairly reasonable historical norm uh, range. And I'll show you some of the data that uh, supports that. So we dig in. These are the three guys we're going to be talking about tonight. There's Thomas McKinney, Gabriel Zuckman is the short one on the end, and Emmanuel Sayez in the middle. All three of these uh, are elite economists at top universities that have received all sorts of prizes and acclaim and are uh, prominent in the media, uh, prominent in policy influence. Uh, I'm going to refer to them collectively as PSZ. So Piketty, Sayez, and Zuckman in the course of this discussion. This is kind of a triumvirate that has worked on this same subject matter for many years and uh, has produced some of uh, the major papers uh, that have shaped the current discussion over inequality. Now, this is an old subject in economics. It actually goes back to Simon Kuznets, a uh, Nobel Prize winner, worked on inequality and the measurement of it at the mid-20th century. And he had some really interesting data. He's also the guy that basically standardized national accounts. So if you go into your macro class, macro 101 GDP, that's Simon Kuznets. Uh, he was a much better statistician than any of these three guys, uh, it turns out. Uh, and that's probably why he came to some very different conclusions when he measured data that we're going to look at in 1953, although they've extended it to the, the uh, 21st century. It's an interesting policy implication, and this comes from PSC's work in general, in that they basically invented a new argument for raising taxes. We think about conventional economic arguments, uh, and you know I'm going to venture a little bit in the Keynesian territory here. Uh, just ask you basically conventional wisdom: Is it a good idea to raise income taxes in the middle of a recession? And even a true Keynesian will tell you probably not. Why not? Contractionary fiscal policy, at least according to their model. Bad idea. And in fact, we have evidence of this. This has happened before. In 1932, Herbert Hoover thought he was going to balance the federal budget. So what did he do? Jacked up the income tax rates. He said this would restore the credit of the United States and solve our problem, get us out of this recession. Turns out it backfires and does the exact opposite. Contractionary fiscal policy in the middle of a recession is a bad idea. Piketty, Sayers, and Zuckman, PSC, upend this by saying we aren't really concerned about the fiscal implications of tax policy. We're concerned about fairness. We're concerned about allocation and distribution. And they said, we're going to give you a new argument here of why you should have high uh, and sustained tax rates at a progressive level on the rich. And this goes back to a theory that they have about the accumulation of capital vis-a-vis -vis labor income. And the gist of it comes down to this. I'm saving you of having to read the thousand page book that nobody else read, but they all bought and put on their coffee tables. Uh, media circulated around. But the gist of it is, uh, Piketty says, and his cohort says, that uh, over history, unchecked, the owners of capital will accumulate more and more capital at a faster rate than earners of income. And in so doing, they effectively become rentiers on society. They reach a point in their lives where they can uh, continue to generate income for themselves by owning stocks, owning property, uh, having capital assets that continues to generate a stream of money without actually producing uh, goods through their labor. Uh, so actually, got to kind of go back into the quasi-Marxian dynamic of labor versus capital. We can set that aside for the moment. But, uh, this is the gist of their theory. And uh, what it comes down to is if the government doesn't come in and check the accumulation of capital, inequality will soar and skyrocket and uh, off to the moon, and next thing you know, you're in Gilded Age 2.0, which they say is a bad thing for a variety of reasons. Uh, I'm not sure I buy them all, but uh, nonetheless, that's the claim. And they say because of this, 
Government has a proactive reason to be involved in using levers of taxation to control the level of income distribution in society. <coughs> Change inequality. It says, regardless of whether you think taxes could be uh, uh, you know, an economic retardant or stimulant in the Keynesian system, we're going to set that aside. The reason we have taxes really is to control the accumulation of, of capital at the absolute top of the income distribution. If that sounds boring to you, uh, I promise this is going to get much more lively. In so doing, they claim that there's a causal link. Causal link is that if you raise taxes, inequality goes down. You lower taxes for the rich, inequality goes up. And their whole method is to prove this historically in data. I'm going to argue that they actually uh, make some uh, steps in their logic and uh, misreadings of evidence that are quite important to analyzing income distributions across history because it causes them to misrepresent themselves as this guy. They depict themselves as advocates of the poor, take away from the rich, give to the poor, make society more equal. But just where I'm going is that they are really this guy. <laughs> it's the greatest of all the Disney movies if <laughs> for that scene in particular. It, uh, it shows the, the, the true nature of the state and its uh, full glory. Taxes, taxes, beautiful taxes. You put Piketty and Zuckman there, and Zuckman be the little snake character problem. <laughs> <laughs> but you get a history lesson in data. This chart depicts the top marginal federal income tax rate from the beginning of the collection of the income tax, which is 1913. Uh, we see it actually takes off with the first bite in 1916. That goes uh, very rapidly up. This is basically until the mid to, uh, 2010s. I could update it to today. I think the top rate is like 36.9%. Like this is the marginal rate on income above a certain threshold level. And uh, people that uh, fall into that income category, they pay taxes at that rate for all income beyond the dollar amount at that level. At least in theory. So there's ways to get around it, with, as we shall see. Uh, but you notice, original federal income tax started out very, very low, small. Actually, it drops off this chart a little bit. I think the, the, the very first one was 8%, and it was on income only in the multiple millions of dollars, or the equivalent of that. It's a, a very small income tax on the ultra-rich. Adopted in 1913 to supplant the revenue system of the tariffs that we had just temporarily gotten rid of. And they discover very quickly that income taxes are a much more efficient way of feeding Leviathan than uh, tariffs are. So the government fell in love with income taxes. That became very useful during World War I. And the United States ratcheted up and entry into World War I. They started raising the rates because they thought, well, we've got to pay for this war. This is going to yield a lot of income. So it jumps from under 10% to, at the end of the war, just shy of 80% of, of income above a marginal threshold. So it's not all your income, but it's pretty high. And uh, there's like three people paying that uh, rate at that time. It's, uh, it's like John D. Rockefeller, Henry Ford, and uh, whoever the third robber baron was. Uh, uh, but it's a very, very high rate. And it was done for revenue reasons. Uh, yielded more revenue than they ever dreamed that they could have gotten from the income tax. Edwin R. A. Seligman, who was one of the major economist architects, progressive era eugenic economist architects of the income tax. Uh, generally a horrible person, but I think he was president of the AEA, so that kind of tracks. So. <laughs> but uh, Seligman uh, writes an article in 1917 and says, I never dreamed this thing could yield so much money. I'm shocked by it and actually a little bit appalled that we're taking so much pe of people's income away. Uh, so system was proven as a very prodigious uh, revenue generator. And then in the 1920s, they started bringing things back down to earth. Leveled out 25% uh, from about 1925 onward until the onset of the Great Depression. Then Herbert Hoover got that terrible idea I mentioned to try to restore the credit of the US government by raising taxes. Boom, 63, 64% overnight. And then FDR just takes that and runs with it and ratchets it up to point that at the uh, end of World War II, top marginal tax rate in the United States is about 93%. Yeah, that's pretty severe. 
That lasts after the war, at least on the statute books. John F. Kennedy initiates a tax cut in 1963. Uh, his successor actually carries it through in uh, an odd stroke of the moment. Uh, then we get to the Reagan era. Two successive tax cuts, 1981 and 1986. And then we've kind of been hovering in that territory ever since. So you can see this. It's an inverse of the Piketty say a Zuckman story. But I want to add one more complication to it. These are statutory tax rates. Statute books are not the same thing as what everyone pays, but you have something called the effective tax rate in the same category. It's so the highest effective tax rate, or at least the highest income bracket. You see there in orange, and we see a new trend, a new pattern. Although in the early years, it initially tracks pretty closely, something happens in the mid-century. They start to part. They diverge, and there's a big gap that emerges in between them. And then after the Reagan era tax cuts, they unite again. So what's the effective tax rate? Why would the effective tax rate be lower than the top marginal rate? Do you think this is intentional? It is absolutely intentional. Rather than cut the top marginal tax rates after World War II, they just coded in a bunch of deductions, exemptions, loopholes. We'll get into some of those. Makes it really interesting at the mid-century mark of uh, tracking income, because it's actually very hard. People are deducting so many things. And then in 1981 and 86 in particular, they closed the loopholes. Tax code is really complex today. I'm saying it was even more complex about 1975 because of all the things you could deduct. So keep that in the back of your mind. But notice the overall shape. It's like an upside down U. Piketty, Sayas, and Zuckman are famous for developing a right side up U. And this is where they get the claim to causality in their story. This is their famous graph that came from uh, uh, Piketty and Sayas, worked together first, they're, they're the older of the two. Zuckman had yet to join the team. Um, and in 2003, they published a famous paper that's since been extended all the way to the present day that claims inequality is really high at the beginning of the century, that all those wonderful tax hikes come in that reduces inequality at the mid-century, and then in 1981 and 86, tax cuts occur, and then inequality starts to soar again. I'm going to point out some exact moments on this chart. See where the arrows are located? Two years that really matter. I'll tell you why. 1943, that's the first inflection or turn in the curve. We go from high inequality to low inequality and then it levels out. So something happened in 1943. Second one, 1986. Would you be surprised if I told you 1943 and 1986 were two years in which some of the most significant overhauls in the entire United States tax code in history occurred? Not in changing the rates so much, although there was one in 1986, but changing the way taxes are collected. 1943, most significant one. Unfortunately, we have Milton Friedman in part to blame for this. That's when they started deducting your tax directly out of your paycheck. Automatic payroll deduction. Much more efficient way to collect taxes. And I want you to do this, it's like a thought experiment. Say you're uh, uh, an average American in 1941 or 1942, and it's the end of the year, and you have to uh, fill out your income tax form. And you also know there's something really peculiar about the early 20th century. Uh, only the ultra wealthy were eligible to pay taxes, because there was a, a very high exemption threshold, and it was about a middle class income. And let's suppose you made the equivalent today of like $50,000. And, and like in 1941, this would be like five or $6,000. I don't know, where's Alex Salter calculate the, uh, uh, the inflation on that? Uh, but imagine $50,000 today, and let's say that that is the, the cutoff. Uh, whether you have to pay federal income taxes or not, if you make $49,000, $999, you don't have to pay federal income taxes. If you make a dollar over, you have to pay federal income taxes. And you're self-reporting. All you do is add up at the end of the year what you got in your income and you put it out on the form, mail it off to the government. How many of you are going to be honest on your taxes? <laughs> Raise your hand. How many of you are going to find uh, some weird little receipt that got blurred and uh, 
uh, or maybe something, uh, some cash under the table you got, but you're just not going to report as income. And that's the difference between you have to write the government a check or you're, you're just off free. Fair enough. Now imagine you're, you're John D. Rockefeller or one of his heirs in that same era. You're a multimillionaire, you get very, very high income. And you decide, you know, I don't think the rates are fair, I'm going to cheat on my taxes. What happens to John D. Rockefeller that would not happen to you as the average American? He gets audited. And in fact, there are vultures in the IRS that are thinking, I can get this guy and make a career for myself. So he gets audited. But you, $49,000 versus $51,000, I mean, do they care? If, uh, uh, they probably care, but there's, there's nothing to be gained from the bureaucrat uh, standpoint of going after you. So this is kind of like a, a public choice of uh, public officials lesson that comes from this. It turns out I'll empirically prove this to you. So 1943, that's a major event. They changed the way taxes are collected, and all of a sudden, something changes in the way that income shares are registered. And notice this, this is the top 1%. We could do this across the entire spectrum. If you wind up all Americans from the poorest person to the richest person, add up to 100%, all it means is finding the threshold. So you get the top 1%, top 5%, top 10%, top 50% of farmers. Perform the same type of calculation. We focus on basically the top 1% to top 10%. Top 10% is considered kind of like the rich threshold, give or take. Top 1%, ultra rich. You can get even four or five grand in that in some examples. So 1943, we'd expect tax evasion to go way down. Second thing happens in 1986, though. This was the second and more significant of the Reagan tax cuts. And he actually stuck, uh, struck a deal with Tip O'Neill, the uh, Speaker of the House. He's a Democrat, Reagan's a Republican. What did they do? The President says, Mr. Speaker, give me my tax cut. We'll reduce rates. But in exchange, I'll let you close the loopholes the loopholes that had existed in the mid-century. Remember that last chart? When we've got a big gap between the statutory rate and the effective rate, it says we're going to close that down. You can see they actually succeeded at that. We're going to close the loopholes at the mid-century, tighten up the tax code, and get it to everyone a tax cut. Another implication here. Imagine that you were a relatively well-off person in 1965, 1970, 1975, and you know you have these exorbitant tax rates at the top. But you also know that you can set up a family corporation and get taxed at the corporate rate, which is much lower. What do you do? Where do you report your income stream? You put it in the family corporation, and then you don't have to pay that tax bill. And this is perfectly legal. It was intentionally set up that way. In 1986, they come along and they say, well, we're finally going to cut the top personal tax rate, and it goes down to, and then even a little bit below, the corporate tax rate. What do you do? You move that income stream over to your personal income. Same income stream existed before and after, called this tax shift. That occurs in 1986. So with those two points of data in mind, 1943 and 1986, then you see this chart you see where it turns, you see the points where the curve is uh, shifting in very distinct directions, you start scratching your head and asking a question. Could those changes have something to do, not with the rates, but with the way the taxes are administered and collected? Turns out, absolutely does have something to do with that. We'll get into that. I'd also like to point out, mid-century is the golden age of American equality for PSC. And they actually presented this as glowing terms of high taxes, kept the rich at bay, prevented the constitution of the, of the capital stock after World War II, and uh, kept things more equal. <laughs> Sounds great in data. What if you lived in 1955 and you're African American? Do you think things are more equal? What if you're a uh, female and you're looking to enter into a profession that has historically had barriers uh, to enter, to getting a college degree, and you think things are more equal? Absolutely not. So the numbers don't tell the full qualitative story there, and this is important to keep in mind. Mid-20th century may look more equal in their statistics. It's not more equal in lived experience, I guess, is the term that's often used. <laughs> important to remember. Nonetheless, let's walk through how inequality is measured, and then I'm going to dissect it. 
you learn this in third, fourth, fifth grade math. I don't know what year they teach this anymore. Numerator, denominator, uh, basic averages. As I mentioned uh, to another group when I was speaking on the subject, I learned how to do those by watching the Houston Astros and figuring out batting averages <laughs> and baseball statistics. It was a lot of fun. Uh, that was a more effective instructor of mathematical literacy than anything they were doing in the public schools at the time. And they even got quite sophisticated. Uh, opened up the, uh, the precursor to Microsoft Excel, which uh, may have been more terrible than Microsoft Excel, <laughs> and learned how to do this. Numerator, denominator. Let's think about this. To measure the top 1% or 10% of society, you need two terms, a numerator and a de denominator. You get the income share that they earn in a given year. What's your numerator? How do you get that? I heard someone mumble, taxes? Tax data? You're absolutely right. You can go to the IRS records and you can figure out everyone above a certain threshold. So say I want to say my cutoff is the top 10% of uh, richest, highest income earning Americans. I can figure that out mathematically. I can figure out what income would qualify you for the top 10%. And then it's as simple as adding up all the tax reported income above that level. IRS has these records going back to the 1910s. Great, simple formula. What about the denominator? Where do you get that? What do you need if you're going to do a, a calculation? Income. Income, total income for the entire country, right? Entire United States. Think back to your uh, macro 101 econ classes. What does GDP equal? The accounting formula. GDP equals C plus I plus G. And then you got your trade term adjustment. GDP also equals something else. Equals Y. What is Y? Income. Output equals income by the accounting identity. I'm not going to say make policy on that. You absolutely shouldn't. But uh, be aware of the accounting identity of output of the entire economy is also income of the entire economy. And with a few adjustments, you can get GDP income to match up with personal income. Earnings to you as a, uh, a worker, as someone who draws income and as a taxpayer. So my denominator is basically a derivative of GDP. Personal income from tax data above a threshold divided by personal income for the entire economy in a given year. And that gives me all I need to know to calculate the income distribution. That's the full amount of sophistication in PSC's data. <laughs> Although they do some tricks with it. I'll do some more tricks with it that are uh, aimed at correcting those tricks. So let's dig in. We'll walk you briefly through numerator issues and denominator issues, and this is where it gets really fun. Numerator issues. We already covered one. 1943. They changed the way taxes were collected. They also changed what counted as income in 1943. They standardized all the federal deductions, and they now use something that you're going to become very familiar with if you ever go to your accountant, it's around tax season, adjusted gross income, or AGI. Before that, they had uh, it was a little bit of the Wild West and what they uh, defined income as. But what, what it means is, a, uh, from a statistical analysis point of view, is all data before 1943 has to be harmonized with all data since. So you have to perform adjustments to make sure that the pre-1943 data is using the same apples-to-apples -apples definition that the IRS uses today, or else it's a junk data set. Who thinks PSC did this correctly? Show of hands. <laughs> Who thinks that they didn't understand the tax code? <laughs> Show of hands. <laughs> Giving it away a little bit. We also have a problem. Pre-1943 income on top of that. Self-reported, therefore unreliable. I'll prove this to you by using the state of Wisconsin. Why? We'll get to that in a moment. Yeah, another complication, as I mentioned, the 1986 issue. The shifting of taxes between the corporate, personal family corporation, and personal income when the rates adjust. That's well documented. And then there's all sorts of weird, unaccounted miscellany. Strange adjustments, missing deductions, errors in the way things were reported. One of the fun ones I always like to point out, when did Alaska and Hawaii become states? 1959. 
turns out Alaska and Hawaii were handled differently in national accounts reporting and IRS reporting prior to 1959 because they weren't states. And in some years, the IRS got really creative. How did they count Alaska? They just tacked it onto Washington State. Like I said, it was closest. How did they count Hawaii? They tacked it onto California. So it's all blurred in there. And PSC didn't pay attention to that. So lots of weird things that happened. We'll get some anecdotes about this. First, the state of Wisconsin. I'll prove to you that prior to 1943, people lied about their taxes. They still do, but they especially lied back then. What this shows is a couple of calculations that uh, were performed by myself and the, the co-author, Vince Geloso. Uh, we discovered a really interesting data discrepancy. In the 1920s and 1930s, the state of Wisconsin had its own separate tax system. Didn't communicate with the IRS, they just collected their, their state income tax, and it's like 5% per year, everybody pays it, no one asks questions, they write their check at the end of the year. The same people also have to file a federal tax return. Do you think they gave the same number on the two returns? Federal taxes were at a much higher rate for most of that period. Turns out they lied on their federal returns. And we found the state and federal tax rolls, put them up side by side. They don't match. Run the calculations to figure out income distributions in Wisconsin. That's the top one and top 5%. See, the blue line is the Piketty, Sayez, Zuckman version of the data extrapolated to the state level using federal income taxes. The green line is the Wisconsin state tax system. It turns out that throughout that era, inequality is overstated because people were under-reporting their income unless they were ultra-rich and thought they were going to get audited. So we've got one big problem there, and it's actually a fairly substantial gap. You know, like five, ten percentage points in some years. So uh, we should be worried about that data quality. And it turns out that if you do this and a couple other adjustments, uh, uh, you know, I'll give you some other fun ones. You know, if before 1939, if you worked for a state or local government, you did not have to pay federal income taxes. Any of you learned that in your New Deal history? You know? <laughs> and think about who that includes. It's not just like the city sanitation worker, dog catcher, uh, police, firemen, teachers. These are all public employees at the state or local level. Texas Tech professors. Texas Tech professors and presidents. <laughs> it's also state senators and state representatives. It's the mayor of Chicago and New York City. Are these people poor? <laughs> these are some very high incomes that are missing from the federal data set because we didn't tax people before. There's a weird quirk going back to the 1821, I think it was, decision of McCulloch versus Maryland, you'll read about. Basically, it was Supreme Court ruled that. Uh, you know, there's competing tax jurisdictions between the federal and state level, and one of the ways they solve the case, case is the federal government cannot tax state governments. The state governments met state employees until they reconcile this in the federal code. Not done until 1939. So we're missing all sorts of income from some very rich people and a lot of maybe not so rich people. It's about 5 to 10 percent of the workforce in that era. On accounted for in PSCs data. There's also sorts of all sorts of weird little quirks. Like for three years they allow you to deduct medical expenses and then that goes away. Uh, they allow soldiers to deduct their military pay during World War II in Korea. Turns out you have a surge in the population in those periods. It's not reported. Uh, so I go through and we perform all these adjustments. Also accounted for some of the issues with tax evasion, although not all of them because the data is not good enough. And it turns out across the board when you perform adjustments, you get from that blue line, which is the Kenny say is open, down to the green line, which is a revision. Overall reduction in inequality in that era just by fixing accounting errors mm. in the numerator. That plays out in both the top 10% and top 1%. Numerator issues get even more complex in the mid century because of these deductions and loopholes. It's one of my favorite ones. It's an ad from a newspaper I found in 1980. You can take the greatest travel experience of them all. The Queen Elizabeth II World Cruise, it departs from Honolulu, Hawaii, hits uh, 
Manila, Hong Kong, Singapore, Bombay. Uh, it runs across the world it's at Barcelona, Gibraltar, and then finally pulls into uh, Southampton, and then it crosses the Atlantic and drops you off in New York City. It's a grand world tour on a luxury ocean liner. Why did they say this ad? Why did they put this up here? It's because in that period, until 1986, from the mid-century to 1986, you could take this luxury cruise, and one of the days on board when you're crossing the Pacific Ocean, you could sit down for an hour or two and take a real estate seminar about how to trade timeshares or something, and you could deduct the whole trip. And these were tested in courts, and the IRS always lost, surprisingly. People would deduct their cruise vacation. And an entire vacation industry emerged at the mid-century, because it was a business expense. You're learning how to invest in timeshares. <laughs> I'm going to knock $10,000 off my income last year. Because that's my deduction. Doesn't make it into the statistics, because it's removed from adjusted gross income. It's a deduction. Another fun one. They really got raised about this. This is like 1983 or 1984. Cruise for free. <laughs> Who would take that deal? Yeah. Our real estate seminar, our seminar, and like how to uh, carve up brisket, whatever you want to do <laughs> on board the ship. I'd absolutely sign up for that. Cabins from $995 to $1,995. Tax deductible, then they tell you you can also add your airfare into it and your, your hotel to get there. You take your vacation around the world and deduct because of those numerator issues. Another fun one. This was actually, uh, I looked up this case, I think it happened in 1963. There was a guy that uh, challenged the IRS in court and won because he tried to deduct his clarinet lessons as a medical expense. So he had something wrong with his teeth and the clarinet fixed his teeth. And the IRS commissioner looks at him and says, hey, this is nonsense. Obviously, this is not a deductible expense. He says, you want a bet? Took him to court and won. <laughs> All sorts of things like this. The Internal Revenue Service has held the cost of clarinet lessons uh, to be deductible as a medical expense after basically being forced. You get really creative in this era. And my god, people did. That's going to change the income distribution. Think about it another way. As an economist, who has the ability to afford the most creative accountants in this era? Wealthy people. So they take the craziest deductions. And that means the mid-century income distribution is probably underreported. Remember, it's overreported when poor people are evading taxes. It's now it's underreported when rich people are taking advantage of loopholes. So the mid-century part is probably too low. They fixed that in 1986. So that's the numerator side. And I spent six, seven years of my life going through finding all these things from the 1910s to the present day, fixing the numerator. Now we turn to the denominator. It's an even bigger mess. <laughs> denominator comes out of what? Output equals income, GDP, personal income. That means if you take the personal income adjusted figure out of national accounts, it should line up with the figure actually dividing things into in PSC's calculations or any of these other calculations. And it turns out through a quirk of weird uh, ratios and, uh, and almost arbitrary adjustments they make to their data series, they do not line up at all. The main way to interpret this chart, now that's a little bit small, the line at the very top is 100%. 100% there means that's total personal income out of national accounts. If we're doing our math right, our denominator for performing this calculation should be right at 100% every single year. Blue line is the PSC denominator. What do you notice about it? Does it ever hit 100%? No. It's the errors. You go in there, there's all sorts of reasons for them. Comes close. A few years, it gets to like 96, 98 uh, percent, then it goes down to as low as 85 percent very early on, and it spikes back up, and then from about 1986 or so onward, it's diverged. And right now, the most recent data shows they are undercounting the denominator by 25 percentage points. Back to basic math. What happens if you keep the numerator fixed but shrink the denominator? What's the percentage that comes out of that? Does it go up or down? goes up. So you got a shrinking denominator means rising inequality. 
I don't know why exactly they did this other than, uh, you know, there's some fishiness there. <laughs> but I spent many years recalculating what the actual denominator should be on the national accounts. Uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, <laughs> That's, that starts in 1929. I had to have this all the way back to 1917, runs up to 2021, uh, which I finished last week. Uh, 2021. And if you notice, there's formulas on how you convert it. It's really small there, but the very top is GDP, personal income. And you have to subtract and add in all these different sources to reconcile them on accounting terms. Uh, I got advice of a tax accountant when we were first working on these formulas, and effectively did so, learned how to do it, and then extended it myself. And line by line by line, you perform adjustments to the entire American economy's income earnings. Year by year, it's a very tedious task. I sick some interns on it for a little while. <laughs> uh, went back and worked on it more myself, took more in interns, but eventually got to the point. And performing these calculations is what basically gave me this chart to prove that they're undercutting their denominator. It turns out, if you fix the denominator issues on top of those already existing numerator issues, it shifts the curve even further down. You go from blue to PSC to our adjustments in red. And these are in the periods, this is the first part of the 20th century. I'll show you the latter part in a second. So this is an article that came out uh, 2022, Vince Geloso and I put together. Uh, we published 1917 through 1960. The second half of it I'm presenting tomorrow is a working paper, but it's the same methodology, 1960 to the present day. And to test this even further, we used our accounting technique, all those numbers I showed you in that giant Excel spreadsheet, to see if I could get it to line up with, with GDP reported personal income. And I tested for a sample of a couple of years, that's that little squiggly blue line at the top that matches the dashed line. We're right at 100%. We're right where we need to be. Maybe a little bit above or a little bit over. There's some data fluctuations that occur from just differences in reporting. But I'd say we're doing pretty good. The red line is PSC over that same period and beyond. So, I've given you all this evidence. Who trusts PSC as a statistician? <laughs> Who would hire PSC to do their taxes for them? <laughs> One or two, maybe. <laughs> Depends on where you are in the income distribution. <coughs> Who thinks maybe PSC are uh, not being fully forthright about what they're representing in their data? I have my own suspicions. But I want to stick to what the numbers actually say. So uh, this is the construction process we did. We've had a bunch of different series uh, that we were able to generate by performing these corrections, worked with some other economists that had done the latter part. Uh, you can see they don't quite lean up, uh, they, they don't adjoin very easily unless you have a consistent methodology across the entire century. So this is what I just finished a, uh, a week ago. It was completed a consistent methodology for the top 10%. We have the blue lines, the original PSC, the gray line, it's just performing all of those technical corrections, accounting adjustments. None of these should be controversial, by the way. I'm not making a political assumption. I'm just saying you did the math wrong, or you didn't know about this deduction and exemption, or uh, your GDP stats were improperly converted. So just by performing those, we see the overall trend is flattened. It flattened quite a bit. It could be flattened even more if I make some more aggressive normative assumptions. I haven't gotten to that yet. Uh, I don't want to, I just want to prove that they are overstating inequality at both ends of the curve. And I think I've done so. The first half, the 20th century, from the beginning until about World War II, there's a good gap of, uh, you know, some years it's five, six, seven, eight percentage points that they're overstating the income share of the top 10%. That's pretty pronounced. Then it compresses at the mid century. We're much closer. It's only like one or two percentage points in some year. Uh, it's actually pretty close. And then, guess what year this is? 1986. It starts to spread again. In other words, we've empirically demonstrated that their big U curve is exaggerated on both tails. The mid-century is probably less exaggerated, although we can 
perform some more adjustments. I'm still working on those as an ongoing project. But you've got exaggerated tails in a compressed mid-century. Remember their basic claim about taxes. High tax rates keep inequality down, low tax rates cause inequality to go up. Do you still believe that claim? In fact, the dates no longer line up. There's a spread that occurs at different points in tax history than what the PSC are claiming. So that's the uh, pretty interesting result. And uh, I'm going to see what, uh, what comes of that in the way that we uh, develop it. Some of you may be saying, okay, well, what about wealth inequality? Is it a problem? Wealth is slightly different than taxes and uh, personal income taxes. Uh, turns out PSE's wealth inequality curve looks a lot like their income inequality curve because one is based on the other. They use the baseline of one to extrapolate the second. The blue line, the dashed blue line, is PSE's wealth distribution. Unfortunately, we don't have good data going back as far, but the Federal Reserve did produce a competing series using uh, much more uh, rigorous data methods. Uh, at least they had direct access to the polling. And I'm not going to say great things about the Fed very much, but this is one area where I think they've, uh, they've actually done a service. And the Fed line over the same period is that what you see there in orange. You can see they show, with their corrections, the same thing we're seeing on the income side. So I think that's kind of a validation. I'm going to wrap this up by returning to that original question. It's derivative, it's extrapolated from the same thing. Do the rich really pay lower taxes than the rest of us? PSC make this claim using all of that underlying data about income distributions to extrapolate what they claim are the tax rates that the rich pay based on their income levels. So one is directly dependent on the other. Fair enough? Well, PSC took that to the New York Times in 2019. The New York Times did what it does with anything that's fashionable and aligns with its politics. It reprinted it and proclaimed it as true, and now it's on the White House website. Now it's all over congressional hearings. Now this is a major claim of uh, uh, senators, congressmen, as a justification to raise your taxes, raise the taxes on the rich in particular, but then they also extend that down into the middle class. It turns out there's a problem with the claim. And I stumbled onto this one random day, it's like a Tuesday night or something. Uh, still remember it because we went out and had a great steak dinner with scotch and, uh, and wine. <laughs> I get home, had a good economics conversation, and uh, you know, my mind's going. I'm thinking about uh, research projects I had been spending the uh, entirety of the day entering in these uh, coded line by line steps of the uh, National Accounts Reconciliation and that horrible spreadsheet I showed you. And I get home and I read this article that was coming out in the New York Times the next morning. I'm like, huh, that's a really weird claim. It's counterintuitive, even up until this point in history, to claim that the rich pay a lower tax rate than the rest of us because we have a progressive tax system. And I also know these guys. I see the names. I'm like, oh, I, I, I'm suspicious of their data. I don't think they're uh, the most reliable data analysts. And I'm scratching my head going over and over this. Uh, they have their data there for the 400 richest family. That's the red line and the bottom 50% of the tax code. And I start poking in behind some of their chart. And you find out uh, their tax rate for the bottom 50% excludes earned income tax credit and all these other deductions that uh, uh, are meant to help the poor. So they're artificially raising the tax rate on the poor by misreporting it. But I'm really curious about this thing at the top, though. That's the ultra rich. There's supposed tax rate has gone from almost 60% in 1960 down to uh, uh, just over 20% in 2018. And remember the data we saw effective tax rate versus the statutory tax rate. This is their attempt to measure the effective tax rate. And I have been working on that. I was like, okay, this doesn't match anything that I know about the tax system. I'm thinking it over and I decide, aha, three or four weeks ago I was on PSE's website and I clicked the download button on their latest data set because I wanted to check something in it. And I forgot about it and it was sitting in the recycle bin on my computer. I open it up, I've got their Excel file of what was the precursor to this data release. I pull up that Excel file and I map the two on top of each other, their same claimed category. Orange is the same as the red line at the top of the 
400 families, or I guess that we did a percent uh, percents of that one. Blue was what I had downloaded and was sitting in my uh, uh, recycle bin, about to be deleted. What do you notice? You don't match up. There's a problem. What happened in that three or four week period between these two things that caused a line that was relatively stable going like this to go like that? They started playing with their data, it turns out. They reclassified how they measured tax incidents for their effective tax rate and got it to follow the shape that they wanted to show for political reasons. That was my initial suspicion, at least. I didn't dare say that just yet because I didn't quite have the proof. But it would, uh, anyone would do if I just made this discovery. It's, you know, it's like uh, I'm going down the rabbit hole of data. It's about 2 a.m. <laughs> I made some more charts. Showed, uh, I'm, like, I'm clearly going to come and uh, work late tomorrow. But it's for a good reason, because I'm, I'm on a research vendor. <laughs> <laughs> made some more charts. And I got one that was uh, uh, kind of showed what I thought was going on here, but without a assigning motive or anything. I did what any good person does and tweeted it out to the world. <laughs> <laughs> I says, here's a strange side by side. The chart on the left is when, when he gave the Wampo and New York Times and all these things. The chart on the right is from their, their data set that they released a couple weeks ago. Can someone please explain what's going on here? And then I went to bed. Wake up the next morning, the thing has gone viral. And it's all well, these economists, like something weird is going on here. And there's others that chimed in. They said, oh, I looked at the same data set. And here's another strange thing about it. Then a week goes by, and Larry Summers, the former Secretary of the Treasury, former president of Harvard, a very well-known Keynesian economist of the center left, is having a public debate with Zuckman, I think it was, over this exact claim over this data point, and Zuckman's given his whole narrative, says the rich are paying lower tax rates than before, and Larry Summers gets up there and says, Professor Zuckman, I don't buy your story. You're lying. I've seen the tweets. <laughs> <laughs> and that may have cost him a job at Harvard, too. Uh, Zuckman in particular, because he's replying at the same time. Uh, I'll wrap up on this point. Uh, this is basically the state of where the project is right now. Uh, this is the paper I'm presenting tomorrow at the seminar. Uh, I've got income distributions across the entire 20th century for the top 1.55 and 10 percent. Probably extend that a little bit further uh, down the income chain. But you see the same thing occurring just with the accounting corrections that we've done to this series and using a consistent methodology across the entire 20th century. You flatten out the curve, the U becomes a T saucer. Yes, inequality does go up and down over time. But let's look at the top 10% there. It generally has kind of an upper bound in the low 40% range across history and a lower bound of about 30%. You know, your 12, 10 to 12 percentage points. That's a reasonable historic norm. It's not the 20, 25, 30 percentage point swings that PSC and all the people that are building their policy claims on are, uh, are, are stating. And if you apply further adjustments to account for some of these issues, like the uh, uh, loopholes, deductions, exemptions of the mid-century, turns out uh, you can flatten out the curve even more. And this leads me to the basic conclusion. Inequality is a thing. It fluctuates over time. But it does not seem to be skyrocketing at the moment. It's nudged up a little bit where it was uh, a few decades prior. But it's also below where it was a few decades prior to that. It may be just kind of a cyclical thing that fluctuates. And really doesn't matter all that much in terms of the determination on tax policy. But on top of that, just the tax causal claim does not line up. So, I'll present that to you. And I think I've at least given you some evidence that skyrocketing inequality is indeed a myth. I'd be happy to take any questions.